Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Those of you online, good morning to you. We are in the book of Acts, chapter 28. And if you have your Bibles, please turn there. We will stand and read verses 3 through 5, and we will try to consider verses 1 through 10. So let's stand for the reading of God's word, Acts chapter 28, verses 3 through 5. And for those of you maybe unfamiliar with this, Paul and those with him, some 278 people, have just survived a shipwreck. They beached the ship, it broke apart, and they made it to shore, and we pick it up in verse 3. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. Please be seated. Anti-venom in ministry, that's what we're considering this morning. Were it not for him, his serving Jesus Christ, he wouldn't be there on that day getting that serpent attached to his hand. Viper bites come with serving Christ. And when we say ministry, we mean serving Christ. Uh, ideally, it begins in the house of the Lord and, of course, finds its way into the community, the population of the world, wherever we are. But viper bites, they come with serving Christ. And yet we have an anti-venom. This shows up early on in scripture, prophetically, speaking of the coming of Christ. He shall bruise your head, but you shall bruise his heel. And of course, the, the bruising of the heel of the Messiah was the cross. But ultimately, Satan will be smitten. And we'll come to a verse that points that out a little later. God wanted Paul to preach in Rome. He had already, some almost four years earlier, penned the Roman letter that we have in our Bibles that comes after in, in order uh, of volume, comes after Acts, and then we come to Romans. They're not chronologically ordered. God, as I mentioned, wanted him to reach Rome, but Satan did not. Satan knew that servants like Paul would be effective for Christ amongst believers and unbelievers, and so he was throwing at Paul everything he could, if not to stop him, to break down his preaching when he did arrive in Rome. That's something that we have to watch out for. You can get so discouraged in Christianity that you become disillusioned and you lose the fire. And the Bible has a lot to say about keeping the fire going, that dependency on God, which comes with perseverance. Well, waiting for God to do things uh, often requires perseverance. Are we not waiting for him to bring us to heaven? So to overcome Satan's attacks and booby traps, because sometimes it's just a funnel assault by the enemy, and other times he places little things in the way, like this serpent that latches onto Paul's hand. God sometimes assigns us to unpleasant tasks to do things we just don't want to do, but they got to get done because that's what it's going to take to overcome what Satan has done. And if you opt out, he'll find somebody else, then you'll have to live with that. And that's not very pleasant, although there are second chances. You know, if, Noah, if Jonah didn't go to Nineveh, God would have found someone else. But Jonah did go to Nineveh. And in dealing with Satan and the world and the fallout of sin in my own life, uh, it's going to take uh, hard work, that uh, stick to itness, that getter done spirit that is uh, applauded in the world and it should be present in Christ also. Now, our physical and emotional feelings, they are important to God, but they are secondary. I think we need to remember that because when we flip it around, we get in trouble. Then we do become discouraged. How come God's not answering my prayers? Where are the promises of the Lord? On and on it goes. So it's good to know that, yes, God does care about how you feel and what you're suffering. 
But those things are secondary to the mission. There are things that have to be done and there are souls involved. Now, if the work of God stopped every time we felt miserable in ministry, nothing would get done. We'd be out of ministers. We'd be out of service, oh, not only on the pastoral level, but on all levels. Feelings will forsake us at a faster rate than duty, than doing what you're supposed to do. Uh, you know, after a while, duty wears on us. But your feelings at a faster rate will, will tear that up. And while Satan tried to kill Paul in the storm, and then with the Roman soldiers' swords, and then this uh, attack by the serpent. So you really have an alliteration here that works. You have the storm, the shipwreck, the sword, and the serpent. Four S's are in that. This is what was hurled at this man of God. And he got discouraged. We know that from verse 15. When the saints come out to meet him, the Bible tells us Paul took courage, which means he was, he was struggling. And it didn't fall apart. It's not, I'm not saying that. But if you've ever served Christ in ministry for any length of time, you're going to meet with discouragement. You have dates with that ugly woman. Or if you're a woman, that ugly man. <laughs> so that ugly creature of discouragement, sort of waiting there, personifying it, because it's like that sometimes. It's like a, a person is waiting for you. I'll meet you out in the parking lot. That would be discouragement. And we're supposed to come out on top of that encounter. God expects us to be prepared. Because when we're not prepared, he still is. I'm going to come to that, because I think it's a little exciting. And get to that in a moment. In a moment. But here's Paul. He's wet. We're told he's wet. We're told that they were cold. I mentioned his discouragement. Serve the Lord long enough. Learn that even in the midst of victories, there is discouragement. He had, he is going to do two, well, two categories, but many miracles on this Isle of Malta, this island. For three months, they're going to be here. He's going to do some outstanding miracles, and yet he still gets discouraged, even with victories. Discouragement will find you, but you should be ready. We are, ready. We are built for this. God sustained him, calling upon him to keep pace and not in a natural way. Because the world can be naturally strong. They can persevere. I mean, remember the Alamo. You know, the world has courage, too. We're not supposed to let them outdo us in Christ. And I think we do oftentimes because we expect Christ to do all the suffering and the working, and we're just waiting for the blessing. And when that happens, work, the effectiveness of Christianity is greatly diminished. This was the case with Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah went to the Lord discouraged. Why the evil people doing so well. What's going on with ministry? Pick this up in Jeremiah 12, and this is God's answer to him. If you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with horses? If in the land of peace in which you trusted they wearied you, how will you do in the floodplain of the Jordan? So Jeremiah <laughs> Jeremiah said, wait, well, I got I to gotta keep up with footmen. Now you're asking me to keep up with horses? I can't do that. And God says, I know you can't. He's going to go on. God is going to go on and tell him, your own family members are going to turn on you, Jeremiah. You're going to smile up in your face. But I'm going to be with you. And indeed, the, Jeremiah's life was in jeopardy, seemingly the whole time is of, of his adult ministry. Because God called him when he was very young. Actually, the Bible says that he was appointed to ministry before he was born, conception. So here you have Paul running with the footmen, then called upon to keep pace with the horses, to enjoy his pleasant time in the time of peace and not let his faith die when that peace goes away and the Jordan floods. This uh, is something that we face as servants. There often is something to bite you when you serve. So don't be surprised if you serve in the usher's ministry or the children's ministry or wherever you're serving 
in Christ, don't be surprised when your feelings are, yeah, get that, that serpent shows up and bites your feelings. What are you going to do? That's the question. Maybe you got a thin skin. You're going to bleed out. You don't make it. Or maybe you're going to hang tough. Verse 3, do not turn, turning there. Yeah, you can look at it with me. A viper came out and fastened on his hand. If that were me, the people would have gone death from my screaming. <laughs> Some are only bitten by life and not in service. And that's, that's unfortunate. Serving is where the action is. That's where uh, God wants us to be. And we not, must not, again, be shocked as believers when we face storms and shipwrecks and swords and snakes. We not, must not even be spooked by these things. And what I mean by that is, is that this thing is when something goes bad, it's sort of traumatic for us, so that next time, at just the rattling of the sabers, we begin to quake because we're spooked. And that's, that is something we have to fight against. I'm, I'm not going down that easily. That's Jeremiah's words, which I try to live up to, but I don't think I've done a good job. Shall a man such as I flee? That's the kind of courage I want for Christ. So Paul, he already wrote to the Romans, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. That about covers everything. He's not finished, though. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, typical of a preacher to say these high things. These, this, you know, It's not rhetoric. It's just these insights the Spirit gives you. And then in time, you've got to live up to them. And Paul is going to live up to just what he preached in Romans as he goes through this on his trek to Rome. Because circumstances challenge God's promises. And God knows that. God prepares us for where he places us. However, if you should find yourself where you don't belong because of you, you have no one else to blame, you goofed, God is still prepared. He's still faithful. Paul said to Timothy, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. He is who he is, and he is trustworthy, and he is omnipotent, and he is not going to stop being that way because I messed up. But perhaps of even, well, as strong an illustration is in Samson. Samson was a hero of the faith. He shows up in Heroes of the Faith in Hebrews 11. But God called Samson to be devoted to him again before conception. Showed up to his parents and said, that boy is going to be a Nazarite from his birth. And Samson, of course, you know, he, he made a lot of mistakes, a lot of lessons to be learned from Samson. But as a Nazarite, he wasn't supposed to have anything from the vine. No grapes, no jelly, no jelly donuts. No wine. You would think that, therefore, he would stay clear of vineyards. But that's not where we find him. First of all, he's going to Timnah, where the Jewish people are not. He's not supposed to be going there, but he's going there. God's going to work with him nonetheless. God's not going to say, now what am I going to do? And he decides to take a shortcut through a vineyard. And what happens? We pick it up in Judges 14. So Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now, to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him. Well, if you weren't in that vineyard, you wouldn't have met with that lion. You see the biblical lessons that are in that? Try not to be where you don't belong. And if you are where you don't belong, God it's not going to forsake you. You don't forsake him. And, of course, Samson destroys the lion. But beware of the devil who goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. In other words, there's more to Satan than a roar. He can hurt. And that comes out with the serpent, and it comes out in Job. Let's look at verse 1 now. That's, so what we have here this morning, hopefully, is that's a topical message that goes along with the exposition. So you get preaching and teaching. 
uh, that's the plan. Verse 1, when he had escaped, then they found out that the island was called Malta. Uh, they cheated Davy Jones' locker. They survived the shipwreck. Malta is an island, 17 by 9, um, the reference materials say. I didn't go measure it. Uh, but it's just south of Sicily, uh, just south 60 miles, which is a long way in those days with those uh, rickety ships compared to what we know today. Anyway, uh, verse 2, And the natives showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. So that's a miserable combination to be soaked and wet. You're soggy, uh, you know, you're... Uh, the soggy bottom boys, uh, that's uh, what's happening. And you're cold and the wind is just, man, what a miserable experience. All this for Christ. Well, Paul, at least, not everybody else. Well, and his, his party with him. These people knew not Jesus. They were not Christians. And yet, they're kind. They're caring. They're helping them. And it likely saved some of the lives. Hypothermia may have been, you know, lurking around, and they build a fire, and they get the, the helping. You know, we, we're so shocked when Christians are not kind, or, or maybe they're the kind you don't want to be around, because we expect more of each other, and we should. That's a, we're accountability, a standard. When Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he just echoed what's all over the New Testament. Be kind to one another, and catch this emphasis tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And there's a lot of Christians aren't too tender-hearted. When they want to justify their meanness, they can pull rabbits out of hats to do it. May it not be you and may it not be me. You know, me, not mean, but may it not be me too. Uh, we have to learn kindness counts even more when we're offended. Anybody can be loyal when there's nothing to challenge your loyalty. Loyalty only counts when you're put in the press, when you're being squashed. Then we're going to find out what allegiance is all about. Now, this word here, it says here, the natives. It's a significant word. Subsequent events will bring that out. The Greek word, barbaros, from which we get our English word, barbarian. But it didn't mean these people were savage, because we can see by their behavior that they're not. What it meant in that ancient world is that the Romans and the Greeks, the high society, considered anyone who didn't speak Roman, uh, not Roman, but the, the Greek or the, uh, the Latin, if they weren't into that culture, that global culture, they were looked down upon, frowned upon, and barbaros was the word that they would attach to them. So what we're learning here is that the, the Maltese people did not speak the Greek or the Latin. They certainly didn't speak Hebrew. Which would have created a language barrier, which is significant because we're not going to read of any converts here. And uh, it doesn't mean there were not any. What it may suggest is Luke wasn't sure. And I, I would point to the language barrier being the reason. And so, uh, and, and again, as I mentioned, Paul's going to do miracles on this island. But Luke, um, not a peep about preaching or conversions. And you have to account for that. That's an omission you don't just dismiss. Uh, so anyway, uh, I, we come back to verse, we come now to verse 3, because we'll slightly return to that too. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. Here he is doing his part with the world. And we have a part with the world. Just because we're Christians doesn't mean, oh, you know, I don't have to work or as hard as the unbelievers. I should be out. I should run in circles around them if I can. Paul was doing his part when this viper attached itself to his hand. As I pointed out, he, had he not been serving the Lord, he likely would have avoided all this drama in his life. His poor eyesight contributed to his failure to detect the snake. It's hard enough to see them when your eyesight's good. He wrote to the Galatians, and this was much earlier, See what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. 
because he didn't have corrective lenses, so he just had to use these big letters. His eyesight was an issue. And, and yet, he, he didn't see it, but he sure felt it. Isn't that interesting? When you serve in ministry, oftentimes you don't see it coming. You don't see the viper. You got your hands involved in serving, and all of a sudden, while you're serving, something inflicts pain and poison into you. What are you going to do? It says, and fastened on his hand. Great. Survive the storm, the shipwreck, the swords, and die on the beach? Satan attacked Paul because of whom Paul worshipped and served. The others didn't get attacked. Paul was singled out. And it must be whom he served, not what he served. We covered that last session. Attacks of the devil. They have got to be either parried or absorbed. You either take the hits or you avoid them. Otherwise, you become bitter. You become bitter in ministry. Then you begin to justify why you don't go to church or why you don't serve. I'm not going out there. They don't know how to. And you become the critic. Do you know of any statues built for critics? Not a virtue, is it? Hey, so and so is a critic. Let's make a statue to him. You got to guard against these things. Because while we might dismiss them, well, that's not my problem. Satan just signed you up, he puts you on his hit list. Well, let's see if we can get him to criticize. Let's see what's in them. Well, this bitterness was something that Moses had to deal with, and Aaron, incidentally. But some of the Jews, when they were fleeing Pharaoh, Pharaoh's army was coming to re-enslave them and possibly slaughter as many as they felt in the mood. You know, once an army gets turned loose, especially they got swords in their hands, it's hard to shut them down. Anyway, here they come. And the, some of the Jews saw this peril and turned on God for allowing peril into their lives. He lets danger into my lives. So we pick that up in Exodus 14. Then they said to Moses. See, Moses is that point of contact. He's the one they're going to take it out on, but they're pointing it at God. Because there are no graves in Egypt, have you taken us to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? What a bunch of snarky little ingrates. You remember what they were doing to you in Egypt? Eh. About the, you know, killing the, the first, the, the, all the males, and then they move from the average, just, we're going to take straw, and you still have your quota. And, we, and they enslaved you. And so you got to work to get out of that slavery some. Because they did have to walk. And now they're complaining instead of calling on the Lord. Great lessons in this stuff for us. So there's two ways to look at this snake bite. In life, people get, metaphorically, bitten by snakes, vipers. That's secondary. The primary is in ministry. That's where the action is. Serving God is giving to God. If you serve and you think you're giving to the church or people, you got it, you got it wrong. I mean, the people are going to benefit, of course. But what shall I give to God? Well, Paul wrote to the Romans, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Giving to God benefits me and others, but not God, because by definition, he cannot lack. He doesn't have any needs. What are you going to buy God for Father's Day? Let's get him a necktie. <laughs> That's not a little gift if it's a nice tie. But anyway, but not for God. It is not what I give to God. It is what God has already given to me. When you, when you make your offerings or you sign up to serve, ideally you're saying, I am giving back to God. He's blessed me. He's made a place for me at his table in eternity. I will share the rest of eternity with him. Because of him. And so for that reason, in serving, it is not what I give to God. It is what God has given me. This is the antidote for the venom. This is the the anti-venom in ministry. Having this understanding that I don't serve to help God. My serving is my gratitude. It is an outward expression 
of my gratitude for what he has done for me, my soul. You who serve and you get weary, that comes with it. If you don't get weary, something's wrong with you. Well, it ain't going to happen. You're going to, at some point, you're going to get weary in the work. Moody's favorite saying is, you know, you get weary in the work, not of the work. I'm sure he amended that. It just didn't make it on paper. There were times he got weary in the work and of the work and of how God does business because our flesh can't take it. And that's the war with the spirit and the flesh. This was the attitude of the first heroic Christians, and God wrote it down for us so we could see it ourselves and be challenged. Now verse 4, so when the natives saw that the creature, the creature hanging from his hand and Paul screaming like a girl. <laughs> All right. I would have been screaming like a guy, uh, which is the same thing. Anyhow. When the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, verse 4, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer whom, though he has escaped the sea, yet justice is not allowed to live. That's their opinion. Here's Paul. I mean, again, if it was me, it would have been an opera. <laughs> have been if you would think you were attending an opera, I would have been screaming so loud. No 9-11 to call, but unquestionably, it's, it's presented to us in such a way as the venom was injected. It wasn't a snip. The serpent not only sunk its, vipe, its fangs into him, but he latched on. Now, I mentioned to you that Satan is involved with this. Job chapter 2, verse 7. So Satan went out from the presence of Yahweh and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. These are loud. As a God. That makes him the God of this age when Paul brings that up in 2 Corinthians. He's saying he's got power. Don't go thinking that he's just a raw. He can damn souls if they let him. But we're not supposed, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love. Be you kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Of a sound mind, which a lot of Christians opt out of. I have no time for a sound mind. I want to show everybody how filled with the Spirit I am. Uh, that's too common to stay on. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind to do something with. He doesn't give us that, so now I got it, and I'm going to go home and <laughs> eat, eat cheese its or something. You got to put it to work. Now, maybe you don't serve. Well, this is tricky because, number one, it is not my job to whip you up into serving. I don't think anybody should serve until the Lord nudges them, and he's the one that appoints servants. However, it is also my job not to make you feel comfortable in not serving. So there's something to, for everybody to do. Um, if, you have, if you say, well, I don't know what I can do, well, get with me after service. There's a bunch of things. Just dusting. You know, this is a big building. You know how much dusting is? You know, it takes a lot. So anyway, uh, and then there's prayer. There's the prayer chain. Speaking of prayer, here is Paul and uh, attacked by Satan. Because if Satan could kill Paul, then he could discourage others. And if he couldn't kill him, then he could just maybe ruin his ministry. That's hell's strategy. But we don't read of them, the, the believers, praying for Paul. Why is that downplayed? That's the wisdom of God. Do you know if you are um, filled with the Spirit to the point that you're more interested in being filled with the Spirit than Christ? If, if that uh, over, uh, overshadows the Lord Jesus, it ain't the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will testify of Christ. That's what he will do. And so God has to sometimes downplay certain instances because we'll overdo it. Prayer is not a demand. Prayer is finding out from God which way we're going. Bringing something to him. making out He encourages us. Be anxious for nothing, but in all things, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. Because there's a lot of work that goes on in prayer 
internally. I am, I am matured. I am enhanced. I'm made stronger by talking to God. But it is not a demand. Okay, God, I've made my prayer. I'm waiting. Uh, so I think that the Holy Spirit downplays that here so that we don't look at prayer as a crystal ball. As, or not a crystal ball, but as an open sesame kind of a, a thing. It is most certainly not. I don't doubt that they were praying for him. It's just the omission of its statement to me is a teaching in itself that we are to pray, but it is not prayer that gets things done. It is God who gets things done, and he uses prayer sometimes. But I can tell you, there are a lot of people in this church that have been here for a long time that I have so much respect for as Christians, and I didn't ask God to send a single one of them. He did it without me praying. And he did a really good job. So you see, the, these, uh, there's a lot more to Christianity than me asking. There are, there's, uh, there's God. That's what it comes down to. And to have a healthy understanding of what prayer is and what God does is to our benefit. And to get tripped up there, you, the next thing you know, you're naming and claiming it, which is right out of hell. And positive thinking injected into Christianity. We, we're not positive thinkers. We are f to be faithful people, understanding that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. And what more do I need than that? Well, it's, I'm given it in Scripture. Well, anyway, that's, um, that's important to me, and I hope it was good for you. It continues here in verse 4. They said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer who, though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. These are conclusions without fact, without logic. There's no evidence for this conclusion. We cannot judge a soul based on what happens to that soul. Job's friends did that. And look what happened to them. <laughs> they, you know, God was not happy with them. They were self-righteous and they were judgmental. And uh, what happened to Job was not because he did something wrong, but because he did everything right. What is happening to Paul is not because he did something wrong. He's doing everything right. Now, they mention justice does not allow to live. Well, they had the Romans, and this teaching found its way to Malta also. They had personified justice as one of the daughters of Zeus. Just, Justitia was her name that they gave to her. The Romans came up with this one. And so they're saying this goddess is judging Paul because he's really bad. And he, he survived the sea. Well, we're not going to make sure he justice is served. And, and there's no, because there are really bad people that don't get justice in this lifetime. And the Bible talks about that. Anyway, these are false assumptions. And it made it into the scripture because God wants to expose the spiritual error and misinformation uh, from such observations. Verse 5, but he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. There you go. The anti-venom in ministry is serving Jesus and shaking off Satan. You got to shake him off. Um, or what, what's the opposite? What happens if you have the viper bite you in life and you don't shake it off? You get bitter, resentful. You hold a grudge. You don't get past your hurt feelings. All you think is me, my, and I. And what can God do with that? Sideline you. Unfortunately, a lot of the people don't get sidelined. They go on and they spread that somewhere else. Revelation 20, verse 2, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. He's a lying slanderer, devil, and he's an enemy who prosecutes, accuses us. Satan. That's what those two words mean. Revelation 20, verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophets are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That is justice, and that's what's going to happen. When we think about fire and brimstone, you probably think about Sodom and Gomorrah. I should say to you that the fire and brimstone that rained upon them, it was not little drops <laughs> of fire and brimstone. These basketball size, maybe larger, Volkswagen size, uh, just slamming into Sodom and Gomorrah. 
uh, uh, there's this actually some archaeological evidence for just that thing. Anyway, uh, here's Luke, the physician, medical doctor. He is there with Paul, but he's powerless, present and powerless. No slight against him or the medical profession. Paul loved Luke. He wrote to the Colossians, Luke, the beloved physician, is with me. Mark chapter 16, though, is what this is, is attached to. Speaking of those in ministry and the miraculous things they endure, they will take up serpents, whether they are literal or in the form of people or Satan's attacks. They will take up Satan's, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. All of that we're going to see happen in this chapter, not the drinking of the poison, though you have the venomous bite, but there will be the sick. Of course, the flesh seeks satisfaction in sensational things, not spiritual things. And it will call spiritual things of God. Uh, they will try to make it sensational. That's where it seeks its satisfaction. The faith seeks satisfaction in obedience, in Christ-likeness. And so, of course, you've got snake-handling churches that are tempting God, trying to show off, look how faithful I am. <laughs> and, and they, you know, they've died, some of them, uh, doing this. It's not biblical. It is unbiblical. No church in the Bible behaved that way. No church in the Bible understood Mark 16, 18, the way the church, the snake handlers, do it. Uh, I, I just couldn't, I, I, I don't. The capacity of human beings for evil is one thing. The capacity for stupidity in human beings is quite another thing. But they're both in the same major league. Verse 6, however, oh, let me pause there. Maybe you've met somebody who believes in that stuff, but they're a nice guy. They love the Lord. Well, those things may be, but on that point, they are out of bounds, and there's no justification of it. In fact, in fact, it works against Jesus Christ and, and the faith. Coming back to this, verse 6, however, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time, they saw no harm come to him. They changed their minds and said that he is a god. <laughs> So we had a little bit to say about this one. They anticipated a natural outcome to a spiritual event. Remember, remember, Satan is attacking Paul. God is allowing the attacks, but God is also countering the attacks. This is clearly serious, miraculous, and unforgettable for all those that are witnessing this. So they changed their minds and said, no, oh, he's not a felon. He's not a murderer. He's a god. They forsook one era and embraced another era. How many times do you see that? You know, people leave one religion and go to a false religion, or leave one false religion for another, or just in other places in life. <laughs> you know, I, I left the New Age thing, but I became an evolutionist. I, I mean, it's just, you're still stuck. They changed their minds and said that he was a god. And the mind without Jesus Christ can be the devil's plaything. And it will spiritually be the devil's plaything. And quick to sow spiritual error, incidentally. They're quick to share this amongst each other, patting themselves on the back. We got this one right. Good people, these were. No question about that as decent people go. But they were wrong about God. And that puts their eternal state in jeopardy, great jeopardy. They were wrong on both counts. Paul was neither God nor murderer. Their criteria for deity was formed without asking God. Their criteria for making a God was formed without asking the true God. Well, that's the case of idolatry as we go through Isaiah, as we go through the Bible. Faith must be by revelation with authentication and not speculation. I know it sounds, I'm not trying to make all those words just flow out like that. But that's the fact. We can only know about God if he reveals himself to us, and he has through his scripture. Peter said, we didn't follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power of his coming. Who do you think I am? <laughs> kind of a, I, 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 well, I'll get to that. I'm going to read that, reread that verse in a minute. But it does require revelation, and 
God does have his proofs built into that. We call them confirmations of the spirit. And uh, the alternative is that you guess about God, which is idolatry and insulting to God, which brings us to experience theology, which corrupts souls. There are those in, who profess Christ, and they exhibit behaviors and hold on to teachings that are based on their experience, and at the same time, those experiences contradict prohibitions or permissions in Scripture. They, it overrules God. Well, I felt it in my heart, brother. Yeah, but that's not the Bible. The Bible says, no, that's not right. What you felt is, who knows, it's unimportant. You can't overrule God because you experienced something. Well, the Bible is just not enough for some people like that. They demand sensationalism, pseudo-mysticism, deeper experiences. Just not enough to come to a church and hear the word of God preached and insights from scripture given. They need to make stuff up. And many false religions are born this way. In Lystra, they did this to Paul and, and Barnabas. After they healed a man, they wanted, you know, they, they bring in an ox and the slaughter to them. This must be Hermes and Zeus, or, you know, and, and, and boom, false religion. Just based on the consensus of misguided souls. And so somehow uh, this is common a common move of Satan, and a lot of people just help him out with this. True, 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 pardon me. Can you tell me what I was just about to say? <laughs> true Christianity is established by the apostles and prophets based on indisputable revelation of God. And if, you've, if you're born again, you know it. You don't care what anybody says about anything. You met God. That's the born again experience. You've been touched from above. The light's turned on. And you saw it all, overview, not the details. That comes later. Matthew chapter 7, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. And we know what happened to the one who did not obey the words of Christ in that parabolic illustration. They were wiped out. So now Peter again. And, you know, Peter was, <laughs> where would we be without Simon Peter? Uh, just an incredible man and a no-nonsense kind of guy. He's the kind of guy that if you, you, know, you told him something miraculous, his first words would be, get out of here. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta show me until he uh, uh, learned, of course. Anyway, uh, he says this in his second letter. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And he's writing to people in 2 Peter that were being persecuted for being Christians. They did not meet Christ eye to eye like Peter did, and yet they're suffering for him. How, did, how is that? They met, there's, there's more to me than my ears and my eyes. Then Ephesians, Paul gives us this theological statement. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. That puts the New Testament... The, the Old Testament is under the authority of the New Testament. They're both God's word. But that's why he says apostles first and then the prophets. Um, and, of course, Judaism rejects this, but this is Christianity. Verse 7 now. In that region, there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island whose name was Publius, who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went to him and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So Malta's mayor's father uh, had the Malta fever, which was believed to be uh, from the goat milk on certain islands, Gibraltar and other islands in the Mediterranean, Malta being one of them. Uh, and the fever was said to last with the dysentery, and that's Luke writing. He's a doctor, and so he's giving doctor language. Uh, not to us, but in the original writings, that's where it's coming from. Anyway, uh, it was said to last for four months, sometimes a few years, to get past 
uh, the effects of this uh, bacteria. So um, there's, we notice that there's no mention of Paul preaching to anybody. There's no mention that when he heals, anyone is coming to Christ. Verse 28, 20, I mean, verse 9, sorry, uh, Luke, Acts, chapter 28, verse 9. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. So they're experiencing miracles. And it doesn't mean they weren't saved. It, it just means that be, probably my take on it is because of the language barrier, Luke could not be sure they understood but experiencing miracles does not guarantee saving faith. If it did, then Judas Iscariot would never have become a betrayer of Christ. We picked this up, John chapter 12, verse 37. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. And so it's, it's not, it's gonna, I mean, sometimes it works, but the bottom line, we are saved by faith. And, uh, by grace, through faith. Verse 10, they also honored us in many ways, and when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. Well, their gratitude for the miracles was seen in their provisions. They are very grateful for this visit, and probably all of the, uh, the shipwrecked passengers and crew were also given provisions. It would not have been difficult, and you have everybody in the neighborhood contributing. But again, here is where we had hoped to read, and many believed, and many came to the Lord. And Paul left, you know, Aristarchus there on Malta to build the church. So did this add to Paul's discouragement in ministry? I think so. It's hard enough preaching to people who want to hear the word. And uh, to imagine doing miracles, sharing Christ, and not having this clear uh, outpouring of the Spirit on the people. And in back of that, the two weeks at sea, being tossed around, the drama with the soldiers, that had to be very real. You know, if we, most of us have not been in a situation where someone's pulled a gun on us and they're about to shoot us. Paul was in that situation. God did miracles to kind people through his servant. And after three months, with their decency, again, we read nothing else, neither convert or critic. And because there's no critics listed, that leads me to suppose there must have been a language thing. So we can leave a place, as Paul now is leaving, and I'm finishing up with this, and maybe the teens are saying, Phew, I thought you'd never get there. We can leave a place better, you can leave it the same, or you can leave it worse. Which one are you? When you go somewhere and there are decent people, um, it's something to think about because they left this place better than they found it. Paul with the healings. The anti-venom in ministry is serving Jesus Christ and shaking off Satan. I think if we get nothing else out of this passage of Scripture for those who serve, it's shaking off Satan. If you don't shake off Satan with your feelings, then the venom is going to do its thing. Let's pray. Now, Father, none of us want to assist the devil. We want to be faithful to you, as we would say, thick or thin. And may you help us with that. Help us when we are discouraged, when our feelings are hurt, when we are struggling in our faith. We know that it is your will that we persevere, remembering that you are with us every step of the way and that we will reach our personal Rome. As you've been listening, perhaps there is someone online or in the church that has never opened your heart to God. Well, God's given you an opportunity to be right with him. You say maybe, oh, because he says so, and that is exactly what I'm saying, because he says so. Christ died for sinners, of which we all are, and there's no denying it. We all do things 
to others that we would not want done to ourselves. We do bad things. We think things that we should not think. And we know that. And these are sins, uh, the things that we do. The violations against God. We do. We break His commandments. You cannot unsin, but you can have your sin washed away, the penalty removed. But you have to come to Christ. If you make this prayer, and you mean it, God will receive you, and the work really will begin after that if you let it. If you say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I have broken your commandments. I ask you to forgive me. I come to you. There's no one else who died for my sin to take my punishment in my place. There's no one else who rose again to demonstrate the power to do these things. There's no one else that loves me like you do in spite of my being a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me and from this day forward be not only the one that saves me from judgment to come, but also lords over my life right now and for all eternity. And now, Father, if anyone has made this, this prayer this morning, may they not be ashamed of it. May they act on it. May they take the first step and let their confession be known to men. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.